Hi everyone, welcome back. We're now getting into the last topic of the course, and this is chapter 16 on vector fields. This section, 16.1, we will look at introducing vector fields and a few basic examples. And then in 16.2 and beyond, we'll look at the calculus of vector fields. So what is a vector field? Well, a vector field is simply just a function that takes as input a point in space and returns a vector attached to that point. So, for example, if we look at R2, a vector field on, on R2 is a function that assigns to each point a corresponding two-dimensional vector. So here's a picture of a vector field. What it is, is it's a measure of the current at 5 meter depth at all points in the ocean. And the units of measurement for the current speed is meters per second. So at each point in the ocean there's a corresponding vector attached. Now only a, a sampling of the vectors are shown here. Of course if you drew all of the vectors for every single point in the ocean it just would be a solid uh, sort of mishmash of different colors. You wouldn't be able to discern a vector at each point. So we just plot enough vectors to get a feel for what's going on. And so at each point in the ocean the vector that's attached to that point is telling us the current at that point. The direction is the direction the current is flowing and the magnitude of the vector is the speed of the current which is measured in meters per second. Now these additionally are color coded. Not only um, do they have varying lengths as we can see from the picture but they're also color coded where the color coding tells us what the length of the vectors are. Another place you may have seen vector fields drawn is in uh, force fields. So here's a magnetic field. You might have seen electric fields drawn in physics or gravitational fields. So the idea is that each point in space there's a corresponding vector attached to it. That is some measure of magnetic field or, or uh, electric field or gravitational field. Here's a concrete example. The vector field on R2 is defined by this function capital F which takes x, y and returns the vector negative y, i hat plus x, j hat. If we were to write this using our angle brackets for vector notation, this would just be given by this vector. And so for example, if we want to know, you know what is the vector attached to the point 1, 0? Well that's where x is 1 and y is 0. So this would be given by 0, 1. Or in other words, that's going to be the vector j hat. And so I see at the point 1, 0, the corresponding vector is that vector there, which is the vector 0, 1. And we can do that for every point in space. Here we've just done enough to get a feel for what this vector field is looking like. All right. Now we can extend this idea of a vector field to higher dimensions. In fact, we just looked at two dimensions or vector fields in the plane. We can look at vector fields in three dimensional space and we can continue on and look at it in higher dimensions as well, but we'll stick to uh, two or three dimensions in this course. So a vector field on R3 is a function that assigns to each point in space a three dimensional vector. So there's a couple of pictures of some examples of three-dimensional vector fields. And again, I mean, looking at the, the picture on the right, let's say, what could I interpret this as? Maybe it's coming from an example where we've got fluid flowing through a box, and this is showing us the speed at which the fluid flows through a particular point. So I can see that closer to the right side of the box, the fluid is trying to move more horizontally, whereas on the left side of the box, the fluid is um, flowing more vertically. So these, these kinds of things could be used to describe fluid flows, which are um, basically velocity vector fields, or we can use them for all sorts of the other examples I mentioned, magnetic fields, electric fields, gravitational fields. So in terms of gravitational fields, let's look at an example. Uh, let's assume that we've got an object of mass, capital M, located at the origin in R3. So there's our mass, capital M. 
and we've got an object P with mass little m located at some other point in space. So maybe I'll put it out here. There's our mass little m. And we want to show that the gravitational force acting on this object P is given by that expression. Negative little m times big M, so the mass product of the mass of the two objects, uh, times big G. Big G is the universal gravitational constant. So that's just some fixed constant. Uh, you may have seen it in physics, you may have used it in physics already. So for here, just think it's some constant, uh, some universal gravitational constant. So universal meaning it applies all over our universe. So we can think of these as planetary bodies then. We've got a mass big M, a mass little m, maybe it's a moon orbiting a planet, and we'd like to know what is the force that the mass big M exerts on the mass little m. Well, we know the direction of that force. It's going to have to be going in the direction connecting the two masses. Now, what is that direction? Well, if I throw a few coordinated axes in here, then what that direction is, maybe we'll put a few more lines of reference in here just to get a feel for this visual spatial of this. So we've got x, y, and z. So this, remember, was at point x, y, z. So we know exactly what that vector is that connects there to there. That vector is given by negative x, y, and z. So we'll label this vector negative x with the vector symbol on top, just meaning that it's the vector with negative x, negative y, and negative z components. And we know that the force is going to act along that direction. So what is our force? Maybe our force looks something like this. There's our force vector we're trying to find. And we're trying to show that it's negative little m big M big G over the magnitude of x cubed times x. How are we going to show that? Well, we're going to start with a fact from physics. So we're going to start with the inverse square law. What is the inverse square law? And in this particular case for gravitation, tell us. Well, the inverse square law for gravitation tells us that the force of gravity that one mass exerts on another mass is uh, proportional to the reciprocal of the square of the distance between them. So what that means is that the magnitude, uh, so I've got the force vector here, the magnitude of that vector, so the force that big M exerts on little m is 1 over the distance between them squared. So it's 1 over the magnitude of x squared. And um, it's proportional to that. And so what is the proportionality constant? In this case, it's the product of the masses times the gravitational constant. So this is known as the inverse square law for gravitation. And now the force vector so we just found the magnitude. We're interested in that force vector in our diagram. That's that purple F. What is that force vector? Well, we have its magnitude. It's given up above by the inverse square law. Times the vector that points from little m to big M. And that vector is negative x, but we want to make sure that we've scaled it so it's a unit vector in that direction because I already have the magnitude out front. I don't want to mess with the magnitude of this thing, so I have to divide by the magnitude. So this is a unit vector in the direction of force. And so just uh, rewriting this, we get it's negative little m, big M, big G, all over the magnitude of x all cubed times the vector x. And there we go. We've just 
showing what we want to show. We used the inverse square law for gravitation, but what we've shown from that is that the gravitational force field exerted by mass big M on masses in its vicinity, as in masses around it, is given by this expression. Negative the mass of the object around it times big M times little g divided by the distance that the mass, the little mass is around it from the big mass. I'm saying little mass and big mass, actually size doesn't matter for this. Um, is the cube of the distance between them times the direction uh, vector. In this case, it's x. All right, so there's an example of a vector field in three-dimensional space. How else can we bring up examples of vector fields? Well, it turns out we've actually been using vector fields already. Anytime we had a scalar function, little f, and we took its gradient, what we produced was a vector field because our gradient of f produced a function which is now a vector. So there's the x derivative as the first component, the y derivative as the second component, the z derivative as the third component. So this is a vector field. And so, for example, we can go ahead and construct this gradient vector field, or what we call a gradient field, for this function. So we're doing nothing more than what we've done in, in chapter 14. Now let's compute the gradient of a scalar function. In this case, we'll just write our function as x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the negative one-half. That makes it nice to set up for the derivatives. So what is our gradient of little f, it is f sub x, f sub y, f sub z. Okay, so what is f sub x in this case? Well, it's going to be the derivative with respect to x of that function little f. So what I get is x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the three halves. That's because when I take the derivative, I get that negative half coming down, and the new exponent is negative three halves. So that negative half comes down, and then I multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 2x, so that just leaves me with a negative x up top. Similarly for the x component, and finally the last component. We can do a little bit of cleanup on this. I notice that I can bring out the negative... I can bring out the denominator. The denominator is x squared plus y squared plus z squared, square rooted then cubed. But when I square root that thing, that's just the length of the vector, and then I'm cubing it. And then what's left as each of the components is just x, y, and z, and that's what we are calling the vector x. So we can write the gradient of this scalar function in this nice compact form. It's negative the vector x over the magnitude of it cubed. So this means that whenever we dealt with gradient vector fields, or maybe I should say it this way, whenever we dealt with gradients of a function in previous chapters, these are vector fields. So we've already been working with them. Now vector fields that come up as gradients of scalar fields these are known as conservative vector fields. So the definition is a vector, there's a spelling mistake here, a vector field, F, is called a conservative vector field if it is the gradient of some scalar function. So if we can write it as grad of F for some little f. In this case, that little f is called a potential function. Now, conservative vector fields turn out to be quite important. They're important in physics. They, they underlie these conservation laws in physics. But we'll also see why conservative vector fields will be important to us from just a purely mathematical perspective as well. It turns out there's uh, a lot of nice properties these have when we get into the calculus of vector fields. So we can ask the question, is the one example of a vector field that we've just worked with in this uh, lecture already, and that is the gravitational field, is that a conservative vector field? So we worked with this gravitational field already. We discovered it 
as a property or a consequence of the inverse square law. Now the question is, is it conservative? Can I get this vector field as the gradient of some scalar field? The hint is, of course, in this previous example. We see that if I start with this as a scalar function and I take its gradient, I get negative x over the magnitude of x cubed. And that's precisely what's appearing in our gravitational field. And so I just need to worry about the m, little m, big M, and big G. And so the answer to this question is, I believe so. Is it a conservative vector field? Well, let little f of x, y, z be the function little m big m big g all over the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Then when I take the gradient of this function, that's the same as you know, pulling out the scalars and taking the gradient of 1 over the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And we already saw that the gradient of that is negative x over the magnitude of x cubed. So this was by previous example. And so therefore we get it's negative little m big M big G times x all over the magnitude of x cubed. And that is our gravitational force field. And so the answer is yes, our gravitational force field is conservative because it is the gradient of a scalar field. It is the gradient of this scalar field. So the answer is yes, F is conservative with potential function little f, and we can write our potential, I'll use this sort of slightly condensed notation, it's little m, big M, big G, all over the magnitude of x. That's just shorthand for the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And so yes, this gravitational vector field is actually a conservative vector field. And as I said, it'll be important for us to recognize conservative vector fields because it makes life simpler when we're doing calculus. They obey some conservation laws and uh, we'll explore those in the later sections. All right, so that's it for this section. We just wanted to introduce vector fields, get a feel for some examples, and then starting with next section, we'll get into the calculus of them. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next time.